In this lecture, we'll be looking at the bony orbit. This is the skeletal framework of the socket. And this is where the high balls and also the associated structures are located. Right on with me as I unfold the morphology of the bony orbits. The bony orbit is also referred to as the high socket. There are two in number and they are bilateral, which means that we have one located on one side and of course another located on the other side. This is where we have the bony orbit here, harrowed in red. Then we have another, of course, on the other side. Even though the bony orbit is located in the anterior part of the face, it is bordered by bones from both the neurocranium and also the visceral cranium. So we have bones from the neurocranial region and also the visceral cranial region forming the structural components of the bony orbit. As we go through with this lecture, by the time we begin to highlight the different borders of the orbit, we see that the different regions of the orbit are bordered by different bones from the neurocranium and also the visceral cranium. So you see it as symmetrical cavities located within the skull. This space that is created, that is referred to as the eye socket, is seen to accommodate the eyeballs and also the structures that are related or associated with it. And this include the extraocular muscles, vessels, nerves, and also the lacrimal apparatus. So we have all these structures embedded within the socket. If you look at it, you see that it is located below the anterior cranial fossa. Within this space up here is where we have the anterior cranial fossa. And this fossa, of course, is the space that is contained within the neurocranium. And we have the middle and also the posterior cranial fossa located behind the anterior cranial fossa. But because the anterior cranial fossa is the region of the cranial fossa that is located in the anterior part, you see the orbit positioned below it. This is where we have the orbit or the socket, and you see that it is located below the anterior cranial fossa because this anterior cranial fossa is located in the anterior part. So this region where we have the harrow pointing is the orbital part of the frontal bone. This is where we have the frontal bone and the orbital part of the frontal bone is seen to be located where this arrow is pointing towards. So we need to crack open this orbital part of the frontal bone to assess the anterior cranial fossa, which means that the orbit is located below the anterior cranial fossa because the orbital part of the frontal bone is seen to border it or form an intercept between the orbit and also the anterior cranial fossa. We can also say that the orbital part of the frontal bone is seen to form the superior border or the roof of the orbit. And at this point, you see it creating like a border between the anterior cranial fossa and also the orbit. So it's good for us to be able to establish the relationship between the anterior cranial fossa and also the configuration of the orbits. Then going further, talking about the outline and also the shape of the orbit. The orbit is seen to take a pyramidal configuration. So it is pyramidal in shape. This is the region where we have the high. And we said that the orbit or the socket is the space or a cavity that is seen around this region. So because it is pyramidal in shape, it will be seen to present an apex and also a base. So if you look at this configuration here, as we've stated, this is where we have the orbit. So this is the configuration, and this is how it is going to be positioned. We said that it has an apex. The apex here is directed towards the posterior part and also pushed towards the median plane. So it is posterior medially. So this is where we have the apex of the orbit created. Then we also have the base at this point where it is harrowed here in white. The base of the orbit is directed anteriorly. You see it directed towards the face, while the apex is directed posteriorly and also medially. Using this image down here, this is where we have the position of the apex, and this is where it's harrowed here in yellow. This apex, you can see that it is directed posteriorly and also medially. And also on this second side, this is where we have the apex of the orbit, where it is also directed posteriorly medially. And at this point, there is a foramen seen at the point where the apex of the orbit is created. And this is called the optic foramen. The optic foramen opens into the optic canal, which allows for the passage of the optic nerve. 
We will also be expatiating more on this as we go through with this lecture. Then we have the base that is directed towards the face region, and this is what is hard here in red. This is also the base here. So you have the base directed towards the anterior part, while the apex is directed posterior medially. So we should be able to establish the direction of the apex and also the base of the socket. Then talking about the walls, this bony orbit is also bordered by walls. It is bordered by a bony configuration. And this is where the walls then come into play. So they have four walls. We have the superior wall. The superior wall means is the upper border and this forms the roof of the orbit. And this is where we have the superior wall that is already in purple. This is what is seen to form the roof of the orbit. If you look at this image down here, this is where we have the superior wall of the orbit that is also arrowed in purple. And Going back to our previous slide, we already talked about this superior wall that may also be referred to as the roof. This wall is seen to border the hobbit and also the anterior cranial fossa. We already established in our previous slide that we have the anterior cranial fossa above here and inferiorly here is where we have the orbit or the high socket. So this is the specific region of the orbit that is seen to border the hobbit and also the anterior cranial fossa. Then we have the inferior wall. This is the inferior wall in this image here, harrowed in blue. Just as the name implies, this forms the floor of the orbit. So you see it at the inferior limit of the orbit. In this image here, this is where we have the inferior wall that's also arrowed here in blue. So this is what forms the floor of the orbit. Then we have the medial wall. The medial wall is the wall of the orbit that is directed towards the median plane. So in this image up here, it is not projected. But going down to this image here, this is where we have the medial wall that is harrowed here in green. It is directed medially. And of course, we have the lateral wall, just as the name implies. It is laterally placed. Also in this image, the lateral wall is not projected here. But using this image down here, this is where we have the lateral wall that is harrowed here in brown. You can see that we have four walls of the Hobbit. And in totality, if you try to look at or establish the number of bones that are seen to form the four walls of this Hobbit, you see that there are seven in number. So we have seven different bones forming the entire walls of the Hobbit. As we go through with this lecture, we would be establishing the different bones that are seen to form different walls or borders of the Hobbit. So first, let's look at the superior wall. The superior wall, as we've described in our previous slide, is the roof of the orbit. That is what separates the orbit from the anterior cranial fossa that we have above. We already described this in our previous slide. So if you look at this image down here, this demarcation here is where we have the roof or the superior border of the orbit. So from region above this demarcation that is highlighted here in dotted red, is where we have the roof of the orbit, and this is the superior wall. You see that it separates the orbit from the anterior cranial fossa. If you look at this image up here, this is where we have the anterior cranial fossa here, we have the middle cranial fossa, and behind the middle cranial fossa, we have the posterior cranial fossa. So if we try to crack open this region, the space that will be seen below it will be the orbit or the eye socket. So the orbit is seen below the anterior cranial fossa. So let's look at the bony configuration of the superior border of the orbit or the roof of the orbit. So this is formed mainly by the frontal bone and specifically it is formed by the orbital part of the frontal bone. We try to go through my lecture on the neurocranium where we describe the frontal bone. We already established that the frontal bone is made up of three subregions. We have the squamous part, which is the upper part. Then we have the orbital part which is on the inferior lateral part. Then in between the orbital part, we then have the nasal part. So the orbital part of the frontal bone is seen around this region. And this is what is seen to form the superior border of the bony orbit. So this is the configuration of the orbit here. Above this line demarcated in dotted red is where we have the roof of the orbit or the superior border of the orbit. And if you look at this configuration, it is formed mainly by the orbital part of the frontal bone. So this is the orbital part of the frontal bone that is seen to form the superior border of the orbit or the roof of the orbit. We also have contribution from the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone. This is where we have the sphenoid bone here. 
This is the greater wing and this is the lesser wing. So this is where we have the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone, harrowed here in black, also giving a very small contribution to forming the superior border of the hobbit. It's also seen as part of the bony component of the superior border of the hobbit or the roof of the hobbit. But the main structural component of the superior border or the roof of the hobbit is the orbital part of the frontal bone. We just have a little contribution from the lesser wing of the sphenoid. Bone. So it's good for us to be able to establish the specific regions of this bone that are seen to form the borders of the bony hobbit. This is where we have the anterior cranial fossa. And if you look at the region where this arrow is pointing towards, this is the orbital part of the frontal bone. Because below it, you have the socket. So above it is where we have the orbital part of the frontal bone. Then posteriorly, you then have the lesser wing of sphenoid. The entire configuration here, demarcated in dotted black, is the anterior cranial fossa at the front, while behind it is where we have the middle cranial fossa. And of course, here we have the posterior cranial fossa. So you see that the bulk of the superior border of the hobbit is formed by the orbital part of the front bone, and this is what is already in red. So if you go a bit more posterior or behind, is where you have a little contribution from the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone. This configuration is what is also presented in this image down here as we highlighted before. So this is all about the superior border of the orbit or the roof of the orbit. So the roof of the orbit is formed by two bones. It's formed by the frontal bone and also the sphenoid bone. But if you want to be specific, you say that it is formed mainly by the orbital part of the frontal bone and also little contribution from the sphenoid. And this is specifically by the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone. So let's drive in more on the superior border of the hobbit, trying to establish the different distinct features that are seen on the roof of the hobbit, which is the superior border of the hobbit. We already established in our previous slide that it is formed by the frontal bone and also the sphenoid bone. Specifically, it is formed by the orbital part of the frontal bone and also the lesser wing of the sphenoid. So driving more on the features that are presented within the superior border of the hobbit, we have the lacrimal fossa. The lacrimal fossa is a depression that is created around the orbital plate of the frontal bone. This is where we have the superior border of the orbit or the roof of the orbit above this region that is demarcated here in dotted red. So there is a fossa that is seen at the superior lateral part of the orbital plate of the frontal bone. This is where we have the frontal bone here, harrowed in red. And of course, this is seen to form the bulk of the superior border of the roof of the orbit. And this orbital region of the frontal bone on the superior lateral side, you see a depression created around this spot here that is arrowed in black. This depression is what is referred to as the lacrimal fossa. This lacrimal fossa is created to accommodate the lacrimal gland. This is the lacrimal gland here that is highlighted here in white. We know that the lacrimal gland is located at the lateral part of the eye, and it is from there that tears is produced from. After the production of tears, this tears is then released into the eye, and it then runs medially, where it is collected in the lacrimal sac. The lacrimal sac and the nasolacrimal dots are located at the medial side. They run from the lateral side where they are produced from, enter into the eye, and of course directed and collected along the medial side where we have the lacrimal apparatus. And it is through this point that it is then released into the nasal cavity. So for the location of the lacrimal gland at the superior lateral part of the eye, we have the lacrimal fossa created. And this fossa is created specifically around the orbital plate of the frontal bone, because we already said that this specific region is seen to form the superior border of the orbit. So this indentation of fossa is created to accommodate the lacrimal gland at this point. So you see it's accommodating specifically the orbital part of the lacrimal gland, because the lacrimal gland also has its own subdivisions or subregions, but specifically you see it accommodating the orbital part of the lacrimal gland. So this fossa is a distinct feature that is seen at the superior border of the orbits. It is located superior laterally within the orbital plate of the frontal bone that forms the superior border of the orbit. Then the second structure is the superior orbital feature. If you drive more posteriorly, because this Lacrimal fossa is located in the anterior part around the superior border. If you go more posteriorly, you have the superior orbital feature. This is the superior orbital feature here that is arrowed here in yellow. It's like a cleft 
or an opening that is created between the greater and the lesser wing of sphenoid bone. So this superior orbital feature is so distinct because it's a feature that is created within a single bone. Then going through this image, this is where we have the cranial fossa. This is the anterior cranial fossa. This is the middle, and this is the posterior cranial fossa. If you look at this junction here in the anterior part, is where we say we have the superior border of the orbit. Because deep to this space is where we have the orbit. And we say that the orbit is located below the anterior cranial fossa. So if you look at it here, this is the posterior region of the superior border of the orbit. And this is where we say that we have the creation of the superior orbital feature. And this is the region here, harrowed in black. So we have an opening created deep to this space. And this opening is between the greater and the lesser wing of sphenoid bone. And this opening is referred to as a superior orbital feature. Using this image beside it for a clearer presentation, this is the configuration of the sphenoid bone. This is the body of the sphenoid. This is the greater wing, this is the lesser wing here. Then we have the foot processes, the medial and the lateral pterygoid plate. So if you look at this space here that is harrowed in black, this space is created between the greater wing of sphenoid and the lesser wing of sphenoid. So this is where we have the superior orbital feature. And this is where we say that this superior orbital feature is distinct because it is a cleft or space created within a single bone. This is just sub-regions of this bone that we have this space created. And this is what is harrowed here in black. So if you look at this configuration here, down here that is harrowed in yellow, this is where we have the greater wing. This is where we have the lesser wing. So you see a cleft created between these two wings. And this is called the superior orbital feature. And if you look at this picture, the way it is configured, remember we say that this is part of the superior border of the orbit. In the anterior part is where we have the lacrimal fossa. If you drive more posterior, still within the superior border of the orbit is where you have this opening that is referred to as the superior orbital feature. We try to drive in deep into the superior orbital feature. You see that the cranial fossa that will be seen behind this space is the middle cranial fossa. Because we say in the anterior part, we have the anterior cranial fossa. But because this feature is at the posterior part of the superior border of the orbit, so the cranial fossa that will be opened into the superior orbital feature will be the middle cranial fossa. Using this image up here, we say we have the anterior cranial fossa here, the middle and the posterior. If you look at where this arrow is pointing, where you have the opening of the superior orbital feature that is created between the greater and the lesser wing of sphenoid, you see that it is opened into the middle cranial fossa because this region here is the middle cranial fossa. It's good for us to be able to establish this. And highlighting the structures that are seen to pass through the superior orbital feature, we have the oculomotor nerve. The oculomotor nerve is the third cranial nerve. So we have the superior and the inferior branches of this nerve passing through the superior orbital feature. We also have the trochlear nerve. The trochlear nerve is the fourth cranial nerve. We have the abducens nerve, which is the sixth cranial nerve. And we have the ophthalmic nerve. We have the frontal, the lacrimal, and also the nasociliary branches of the ophthalmic nerve, also passing through the superior orbital feature. Then we have the superior ophthalmic vein, also as one of the components or structures that are seen to pass through the superior orbital feature. So going further, let's look at the inferior border. The inferior border or the inferior wall of the orbit is seen to form the floor of the orbit. And this is what is highlighted here and demarcated in dotted black. This is what is seen at the inferior limit of the orbit. So the floor of the orbit is seen to form the roof of the maxillary sinus. If you look at this image here, this is where we have the maxillary bone here, harrowed in grain. And the floor of the orbit is seen to form the roof of the maxillary sinus. So if you have the maxillary sinus here, the roof of this sinus is formed by the floor of the orbit. So this is understandable. And this is what is presented in this image. So let's look at the bones that contribute to the formation of the floor of the orbit. And this include the maxillary bone, the specific region of the maxilla that is seen to contribute to the flow of the orbit is the orbital surface. So this is where we have the maxillary bone here, harrowed in red, and we have the orbital surface here also harrowed in red. The orbital surface of the maxilla is seen to form the floor 
of the orbit or the inferior border of the orbit. And this is what forms the bulk of the contribution of the floor of the orbit. This also has a little contribution from the zygomatic bone. This is the zygomatic bone here, harrowed in black. And you see that the floor of the orbit is formed by a little contribution from the zygomatic bone. The entire alignment here is what is seen to form the floor or the inferior border of the orbit. And you see that the bulk of this space is formed by the orbital part of the maxillary bone. And a little contribution here is formed by the zygomatic bone. Why the zygomatic bone still extends or where it forms the lateral border of the orbit? We'll soon be getting to the lateral wall or border of the orbit. Then we have the smallest contribution from the palatine bone. This is where we have the palatine bone here, harrowed in white. The palatine bone is seen to form the smallest contribution. And this is seen behind so if you look at the posterior part of the floor of the orbit is where we have the placement of the palatine bone. And this is seen to form the smallest contribution onto the formation of the floor or the inferior border of the orbit. So the main contribution is from the maxilla and specifically is from the orbital part of the maxilla. Then we have a small contribution from the zygomatic bone. Why the smallest contribution is from the palatine bone. And this palatine bone is seen to be placed at the posterior part Going further, let's look at the distinct features that are seen on the floor of the orbit. So the inferior border of the orbit that's also referred to as the floor of the orbit, we have distinct features. So the first one is the infraorbital groove. This is where we have the infraorbital groove. This groove is like a depression that is seen on the floor of the orbit or the inferior border of the orbit. If you look at it, there's an indentation created here around the orbital part of the maxillary bone. And this infraorbital groove will later be transformed into the infraorbital canal. So it will be converted from being a depression to being a canal. This allows for the passage of the infraorbital nerve. The infraorbital nerve is a branch of the maxillary nerve, which is the second branch of the trigeminal nerve. So we also have the infraorbital vessels also passing through the infraorbital canal. So if you look at this image up here, this is where we have the floor of the orbit. This is the inferior border. And you have this depression created as a groove that is referred to as the infraorbital groove. So as you see it parting within the maxilla, it is then transformed into a canal. And this is referred to as the infraorbital canal. So it's still the same named canal. It is initially begins as a groove before it is later converted or transformed into a canal. And as it is transformed into a canal, you see it now finally emerging as the infraorbital foramen. So this is what is presented in this image. This is where we have the infraorbital groove. This infraorbital groove will be transformed into infraorbital canal. And this canal will be seen to pass through the maxillary bone before it finally opens out into the infraorbital foramen. And this is where we have the infraorbital foramen here, harrowed in green. So you can see that initially it begins as a groove. We have the infraorbital groove. From being the infraorbital groove, you see it being directed towards the maxilla and that is where it becomes converted into the infraorbital canal. From the infraorbital canal, you see it emerging out as a small O created around the inferior part of the orbit around the region where we have the maxilla, and this is then referred to as the infraorbital foramen. So you can see it being transformed from infraorbital groove to infraorbital canal to infraorbital foramen. So that is how this transformation is created around this point. You can see how interesting this presentation is. Then the other structures or distinct features that we see within the floor of the orbit is the inferior orbital feature. Remember a superior orbital feature that we say that is distinct in the sense that it's a cleft that is formed between two sub-regions of a single type of bone. For the inferior orbital picture, it is a cleft or a gap that is created between the different regions of two bones. So that's the difference between the superior orbital picture and the inferior orbital picture. This is where we have the inferior orbital picture here. You can see the space created. And it is created between the greater wing of sphenoid and also the maxilla. This is where you have the sphenoid bone here, harrowed in white. And this is where you have the maxilla here also arrayed in white. So if you look at the space between it, you have the greater wing of sphenoid, which is a specific region of the sphenoid, creating a space or a gap between it and also the maxilla. And this is where we have the orbital part of the maxilla. So you have this space here harrowed in green, and this is referred to as the inferior orbital feature.
because we have a feature also created above it around the roof of the orbit, which is called the superior orbital feature. Let's try and highlight the structures that seem to pass through the inferior orbital feature. This includes the zygomatic branch of the maxillary nerve. You know that the maxillary nerve is the second branch of the trigeminal nerve, which is the fifth cranial nerve. Then we have the infraorbital vessels, which include the infraorbital arteries, infraorbital veins, and also the infraorbital nerve. So this group of infraorbital vessels will pass through the inferior orbital feature before they are being directed into the infraorbital group, which is then further converted into the infraorbital canal. Then you see it exiting the canal through the infraorbital foramen. You can see how the infraorbital vessels, how they run within the orbit and also exiting the orbit. Then the next structure is the orbital branches of the pterygopalatine ganglion. So going further, let's look at the medial border. We already described this border in our previous slide that is located close to the median plane. So you see it on the medial side of the orbit. So this is where we have the medial border of the orbit in this image up here, carried here in white. So what are the bones that are responsible for forming or contributing to the formation of the medial wall or the medial border of the orbit? It is a number of bones and we'll be highlighting these bones from anterior to posterior. So from the front, the first bone we have is the maxilla. This is the maxilla here. So deep to the maxilla, the next bone is the lacrimal bone. This is the lacrimal bone here, harrowed in white. Then the next bone is the ethmoid. The specific region of the ethmoid bone is the lateral plate of the ethmoid. We've described this in our lecture on the ethmoid bone. If you've not checked that lecture, please kindly go and do so. We said that the lateral plate of the ethmoidal labyrinth is seen to border the medial wall of the orbit, and this is where that is established. So this is the ethmoid bone here, harrowed in purple. This is the next bone that will be seen after the lacrimal bone. Then the next bone after the ethmoid will then be the sphenoid, and this is the sphenoid here harrowed in blue. You can see that we have four bones forming the medial wall or the medial border of the orbit. So from the front down to behind, we have the maxilla, we have the lacrima, we have the ectmoid, then we have the sphenoid. So this is how the arrangement is when you try to position it from anterior to posterior, still along the medial border. So talking about the specific features, what are the distinct features that are seen along the medial border of the orbit? The first one is the lateral plate of hetmoid. The lateral plate of hetmoid, we also described this as we stated before. This is the lateral plate of hetmoid, yeah, harrowed in green. This lateral plate of hetmoid is seen around the hetmoidal labyrinth. This is the configuration of the hetmoid bone here. This is where we have the lateral plate of hetmoid because it is located on the lateral side of the hetmoidal labyrinth. And this is the medial plate of the ethmoidal labyrinth at this region. So on the lateral plate of the ethmoid, I will know that the ethmoid is located on top of the nasal cavity between the two orbits. So if you try to position this bone on top of the nasal cavity between the two orbits, you see that this lateral plate will be seen to form the medial wall of the orbit. So you have the orbit on both sides. So this is the lateral plate of the ethmoidal labyrinth, and this is the orbit, this is the medial wall of the orbit, and this is the lateral of the orbit. So you can actually see that the lateral plate of ethmoid is positioned around the medial border of the orbit. And that is why it was highlighted as part of the bony configuration of the medial wall of the orbit. So if you look at this configuration, you see that the lateral plate is seen to contribute the largest in terms of structural configuration to the medial wall of the orbit. And if you try to crank down from the medial wall of the orbit, the next structure that will be seen are the ethmoidal sinuses. So we have the ethmoidal sinuses deep to the lateral plate of the ethmoid. So if, in case of any fracture, if there is breakage of the lateral plate of ethmoid, it will definitely be affecting the ethmoidal sinuses. If we try to position how the ethmoid bone is placed in relation to the orbit, you see that the lateral plate of the ethmoid is seen to border the medial wall of the orbit. And of course, it forms the largest contribution. Then the next structure that is seen is the anterior and the posterior ethmoidal foramina. If you look at where we have the ethmoid bone, there's a region where the ethmoid bone forms contact with the frontal bone. And this region here is what is called the frontoethmoidal suture. 
it is a structure that connects this frontal bone with the ethmoid bone. So if you look at the anterior and the posterior part of this region, you have a foramina created. And this is what is called the anterior and posterior ethmoidal foramina. So we have holes created at the point where the ethmoid bone unites with the frontal bone at this point. If you look at this image up here, the orbit, it is open here, it is cracked open here. So the wall that you are seeing in this image up here is the medial wall of the orbit. And if you look at it, you have the foramina, we have the posterior ethmoidal foramen, you have the anterior ethmoidal foramen. So at this point, they allow for the passage of the posterior and the anterior ethmoidal nerves respectively. We described these nerves in our previous part three lecture on the nasal cavity, where we described the innervations of the nasal cavity. So if you look at this image down here, this is where we have the ethmoid here, highlighted in purple, and this is where we have the frontal bone. And there is a suture here that is called the frontoethmoidal suture that tends to connect the ethmoid bone with the frontal bone. So in the anterior part and the posterior part here, you have holes created. So in this part, in the posterior part, you have the posterior ethmoidal foramen. And in the anterior part here, you have the anterior ethmoidal foramen. So these foramen are so created to allow for the passage of the posterior and the anterior ethmoidal nerves respectively. And the anterior and the posterior ethmoidal nerve are branches from the ophthalmic nerve, which of course is the first branch of the trigeminal nerve. Then we also have the lacrimal groove we have an indentation that is created between the lacrimal bone and also the maxillary bone at this point. So this is where we have the lacrimal groove. So there's a groove created here between the lacrimal bone and the maxillary bone. And this groove is so named as the lacrimal groove. This groove is to accommodate the lacrimal sac. Remember we talked about the lacrimal fossa as the superior lateral part of the roof of the orbit when we try to describe the superior border of the roof of the orbit. But, and that creates accommodation for the lacrimal gland that is located at the superior lateral part of the orbit. We said that after the production of tears by the lacrimal gland, the tears is released into the eye where it is collected at the media side of the eye, where we have the lacrimal sac. This lacrimal sac is located within the lacrimal groove at the media side of the eyes, as we have projected. So we have the lacrimal groove created between the lacrimal bone and also the maxillary bone. So this creates accommodation site for the lacrimal sac. Through which the nasal lacrimal dots will then drain the tears and empty it into the nasal cavity. Going further, let's look at the lateral wall of the orbit. The lateral wall, the lateral border of the orbit is formed by two bones. It's formed by the zygomatic bone in the front, and this is the zygomatic bone. While behind, it is formed by the greater wing of sphenoid bone. And this is the greater wing of sphenoid bone. So on the lateral side of the orbit, at the front, we have the zygomatic bone, while behind, we have the greater wing of sphenoid bone. So talking about the distinct features of the lateral border or the lateral wall, we have the witness tobacco. The witness tobacco is like an elevation of bone or thick mass of bone that is seen on the lateral wall of the orbit. And this is where this is positioned. If you look at the lateral wall of the orbit at this region, you see that you have a thick mass projected along this lateral border. And this is called the witness tobacco. This witness tobacco is a prominence that is seen on the orbital surface of the zygomatic bone. The zygomatic bone we already established in our previous slide that it is seen to form lateral wall, lateral border of the orbit. And because this tobacco is formed on this zygomatic bone, it means it will be seen at the outer part of the lateral border of the orbit. Remember in our previous slide, when we tried to describe the bony configuration of the lateral wall, of the orbit, we said that on the outer part, it is formed by the zygomatic bone, while on the inner part, it is formed by the greater wing of the sphenoid. So what this means is that the witness tobacco will be seen at the outer part of the lateral wall of the orbit. So that is where it is positioned here. And it is also seen to be located inferior to the frontal zygomatic suture. Just from the name, I've always said on this channel that all we need to do in anatomy is to break the name down. So if you try to break this name down, it means that it's a suture that is created between the frontal bone and also the zygomatic bone. So this is where we have the suture here or the connection point between the frontal bone and the zygomatic bone. So this witness tobacco is seen inferior to the frontozygomatic suture. So this is the suture here that is harrowed in green. And this frontozygomatic suture is formed at the connection point 
between the zygomatic process of the frontal bone, this is the zygomatic process of the frontal bone. The zygomatic process of the frontal bone means a process of the frontal bone that is directed towards the zygomatic bone, just from the name. So it is the zygomatic process of the frontal bone connecting with the frontal process of the zygomatic bone. At the inferior part here is where we have the zygomatic bone, and the frontal process of this zygomatic bone would then be the extension that is directed towards the frontal bone from the zygomatic bone. So this is where we have the frontal bone up here and inferior to it, we have an extension directed towards the zygomatic bone. And this is what is called the zygomatic process of the frontal bone. Also inferiorly here, we have the zygomatic bone. And of course, this also presents a process or an extension that is directed towards the frontal bone. And this is called the frontal process of the zygomatic bone. So the two processes form a suture at this point that is harrowed here in green. And this is what is referred to as the frontozygomatic suture. It is below this suture that we have this protrusion or tobacco that is already in yellow that is referred to as the witness tobacco. So this is where we have the witness tobacco here at this point. And this is an important landmark. So going further, let's look at the structures that are seen to attach to this site. We have a number of ligaments that seem to be attached to this witness tobacco. So the first one is the chest ligament of the lateral rectus muscle. This is the lateral rectus muscle here, harrowed in black. We also have a medial rectus muscle on the medial side. So the lateral rectus muscle is seen to present sheets of fascia seem to be connected to the witness tobacco at the lateral surface of the orbit. This is the check ligament here connecting to the witness tobacco. We also have the lock wood or the suspensory ligament. This is the lock wood or the suspensory ligament here, highlighted in white, and it extends from the medial side down to the lateral side. On the lateral side is seen to be connected to the witness tobacco. Then we have the lateral papebral ligament. This is the lateral papebral ligament here that is highlighted and you see it, it is connected also to the witness tobacco. This lateral papebral ligament has a superior horn and also an inferior horn. So the superior and the inferior horn is what actually unite at this lateral region to form this ligament. And of course, this ligament is then seen to be connected to the witness tobacco. We also have the lateral horn of the levator papillary superioris aponeurosis. So this is a muscle that is seen to present aponeurosis. So this is the muscle here. This muscle is seen to present aponeurosis. And this is what is highlighted here in red. So this aponeurosis is seen to present lateral horn. And this is the lateral horn here highlighted in dotted red. It is this lateral horn that is then seen to be inserted onto the witness tobacco. So you see that the lateral horn of the aponeurosis is seen to be connected also to the witness tobacco. Then lastly, we have the fascia of the lacrimal gland. Remember we described the lacrimal fossa as a depression that is created on the orbital part of the frontal bone, seen around the superior lateral part of the orbit. When we try to describe the roof or the superior border of the orbit. So we have the accommodation site here created, and we have the lacrimal gland here highlighted in yellow embedded within this fossa. So the fascia covering the lacrimal gland is also seen to be attached onto the witness tobacco. So you can see that we have a number of structures that are seen to have their connection site on the witness tobacco. And this is what we have highlighted. So it's good for us to be able to also highlight this different ligament that seem to be connected onto the witness tobacco. So summarily, Taking the entire configuration of the bony orbit in terms of its bony structural component, we've highlighted a number of bones. And remember that at the beginning of this lecture, we stated that we have seven bones in totality forming the entire configuration of the bony orbit. So let's try and highlight these bones. And the first one is the frontal bone. This is the frontal bone here, Harold up here. We already described this as one of the structural components forming the roof or the superior border of the orbit. And this also is supported by the lesser wing of sphenoid. This is where we have the lesser wing of sphenoid also contributed to forming the roof of the orbit. Then we have the maxillary bone. 
This is the maxilla here, also arrayed in white. The maxilla also presents an extension up along the medial border. And this is seen in the most anterior region of the medial border. So when we try to highlight the bones that form structural components of the medial border, the maxilla will be the first to be highlighted because it is the one that is positioned in the anterior part. And deep to the maxilla, we have the lacrimal bone. This is the lacrimal bone here, also arrayed in white. And this is followed with the hectmoid. And we have the ethmoid also here, arrayed in white. After the hectmoid, then we have the sphenoid bone. So these are the bones that are seen to form the medial wall or the medial border of the orbit. Then going further on the inferior border or the floor of the orbit, we have the maxilla forming the major structural component of this region. And this is the maxilla here. And this followed with the zygomatic bone. This is the zygomatic bone here, also contributing to the formation of the floor or the inferior wall of the orbit. And this is also supported by the palatine bone. This is where we have the palatine bone here, also arrayed in white, giving the smallest contribution to the formation of the floor or the inferior border of the hobbit. Then lastly, we have the lateral border. This is the lateral border here. And the lateral border of the orbit is formed in the anterior part by the zygomatic bone. And if you go more posteriorly, it has a contribution also from the greater wing of the sphenoid bone. So you can see that the entire bony configuration of the orbit is formed by these seven bones. And it's also important for us to be able to highlight the specific regions of these bones that seem to contribute to the different regions or borders of the hobbits. So let's look deep on the apex. We already described that the apex is seen at the posterior part and it's also directed medially. So it is located posterior medially. And this is where we have the apex using this image down here. This is where the apex is. We say it is directed behind why the base that is directed anteriorly to the face. And of course at the apex, we have a distinct picture that is seen to align at the position where the apex of the orbit is. And this is the optic foramen. So we have the optic foramen opened into the optic canal, and this is positioned around the region where we have the apex of the orbit. This is the optic foramen, of course, which opens into the optic canal. This optic canal opens into the middle cranial fossa. Remember when we tried to describe the roof of the orbit? We said the roof of the orbit is located inferior to the anterior cranial fossa. And the apex of the orbit, we already established that it is directed posterior medially. So if it's directed posteriorly, it means it will be opening into a fossa that is located behind the anterior cranial fossa. And this is the middle cranial so that is why it is saying that the optic canal is opened into the middle cranial fossa, and it's good for us to be able to highlight this. And this optic canal allows for the passage of the optic nerve and also the ophthalmic artery. So these structures are seen to pass through the optic canal, which is located at the apex of the orbit. Also going further on the base, we already described the base being positioned anteriorly, so it is opened onto the face. So the alignment of the base is referred to as the orbital rim, just like the rim of a tire. So you see this is what is highlighted here in dotted black. So it forms the orbital rim around the anterior part of the face. In this upper image here, this is where we also have the orbital rim, which is of course, is the region where the base of the orbit sits or rests on. So talking about the entire configuration of the orbital rim, it also has its own bony configuration. So the different regions of the orbital rim are also formed by different bones. Superiorly, it is formed by the frontal bone. This is where we have the frontal bone above. Then talking about the inferior border, the inferior border at this point is formed by the maxilla at the medial side, and laterally it is formed by the zygomatic bone. And this is the maxilla here, harrowed at this point. And this is the zygomatic bone here, harrowed at the lateral side. So you see these two bones forming the inferior border of the orbital rim. Then going further, we have the medial border. The medial border is formed by the frontal process of the maxilla. This is the maxilla here, as we've initially highlighted. So this maxilla develops an extension that is directed towards the frontal bone up here. And this is referred to as the frontal process of the maxilla. And this is what is seen to align 
with the medial border of the orbital rim. Then on the lateral border of the orbital rim, we have the frontal process of the zygomatic bone, and we also have the zygomatic process of the frontal bone. We've tried to establish this in our previous slide. If you look at this image up here, this is where we have the frontal process of the zygomatic bone. This is the zygomatic bone here, highlighted in blue, but this zygomatic bone, of course, has an extension that is directed towards the frontal bone, and that is why it is so named the frontal process of the zygomatic bone. And if you look above here, you also have an extension from the frontal bone here that is directed towards the zygomatic bone. And this is referred to as the zygomatic process of the frontal bone. So these two processes are seen to form the lateral border of the orbital ring, which of course is where the base of the orbit rests on or falls on, and is of course opened onto the face. So these are the different bones that are seen to form the border of the orbital ring. Then we also have the supraciliary arch. It's good for us to highlight this. And this is like a prominence that is seen at the superior part of the orbital ring. We said that the superior part of the orbital ring is formed by the frontal bone above. That is what forms the superior upper border of the orbital ring. There is a protrusion that is created by this frontal bone, and this is referred to the supraciliary arch. This is where we have the supraciliary arch. We have on both sides, and in between this, we have the glabella. This is the glabella here, harrowed in red. And this is like a depression that is created after the elevations on the two lateral sides. We say when we have elevation, we definitely be having a depression. So this is the depression here that is referred to as the glabella. But this protrusion that is referred to as the supraciliary arch is more prominent in male. So if you see, you see that male, they tend to carry a more prominent supraciliary arch, while in female, it is less prominent. We also have the supraorbital foramen. The supraorbital foramen is created on the medial side on the superior part of the orbital ring. Using this image up here, this is where we have the superior border of the orbital ring. And at the medial side, we have the supraorbital foramen. And this is what is harrowed here in black. This supraorbital foramen allows for the passage of the supraorbital nerve. And the supraorbital nerve is a branch of the frontal nerve which of course branches from the ophthalmic nerve. And we know that the ophthalmic nerve is the first branch of the trigeminal nerve, which is the fifth cranial nerve. So this is what is configured around the orbital ring. So it's also good for us to be able to establish those distinct features that are created around this space. Let's look at the content of the bony hobbit. The bony hobbit is not an empty space. It is seen to contain the eyeballs. So we have the eyeballs embedded within it and also the associated structures. So what are the structures that are associated with the eyeball? We have the extraocular muscle. These extraocular muscles are muscles that attach to the outer part of the eyeball, with thereby helping to hold the eyeball in place and also helping to control eye movement. We also have nerves. We have the optic nerve. We have the oculomotor nerve the trochlear nerve, the trigeminal, and the abducens nerve. All these nerves are seen to be contained within the bony orbit. We've tried to highlight this in our previous slide. We also have blood vessels. We have the ophthalmic artery. We have the superior and the inferior ophthalmic veins. Then we have the lacrima apparatus. We've also tried to highlight this in our previous slide that we have a depression created above here, which is the lacrima fossa that creates accommodation sites for the lacrima gland. This is around the superior border of the orbit. Also at the medial wall, we have the creation of the lacrima groove, which helps to accommodate the lacrima sac. So we have the lacrima apparatus also having the accommodation site within the bony orbits. Then it's good for us to know, we also have spaces that are left and these spaces are filled with orbital fat. And this orbital fat, what they do primarily is to help pushing the eyeball and also stabilize the extraocular muscle and also other structures that are contained within the orbit. So we have the orbital fat helping in this regard. Then let's look at clinical anatomy. Let's look at orbital fracture. This is breakage of the bones that are seen to form the structural component of the orbit. And this is most seen in the floor of the orbit. This is the most common site where 
orbital fracture is seen to occur. And at the flow of the orbit, we know the major structural component of this region is the maxilla. Then in the case of the medial fracture of the orbit, we know that around the medial wall of the orbit, we have the lateral plate of the ethmoidal labyrinth seen to form the medial wall of the orbit. So if there's fracture, of the medial wall of the orbit, it means the lateral plate of the ethmoid bone will be broken. And if this occurs, the next structure that is seen after it are the ethmoidal air sinuses. So it's going to affect the ethmoidal air sinuses in case we have fracture of the medial wall of the orbit. And it's good for us to be able to justify this because of the position of the ethmoidal sinuses being sandwiched between the lateral plate and also the medial plate of the ethmoidal labyrinth. Let's check our understanding of this lecture. And the first one is to list the bones that form the medial and the lateral walls of the bony orbit. The second question is what foramen is positioned on the apex of the bony orbit? The third question is what is witness tobacco and its relevance? And the fourth question is what bones form the superior and the inferior orbital features? This should come easy. And the last question is, what forms the bulk of the roof of the bony orbit? We've highlighted this in our slide when we try to describe the superior border of the bony orbit. So thanks for watching this video. Let's meet again.